So this is the positional study of the Study Chess With Me program. We looked at the tactics in the previous video, and in this one, we're going to go back to Ludwig Pachmann and his wonderful book, The Complete Chess Strategy. Now, the last time we were looking at blockading pawns, and we're going to pursue that. And in this particular video, we're going to be looking at some exemplary games by the great Aaron Nimzovich. Now, as a quick reminder, I am not a grandmaster. I will be studying these genuinely live and there will be no engine. So whatever you hear me say in terms of tactics, opinions, whatever, they are my own. Now there's a reason for this. This is study, and it's not just study for you, even though you of course will benefit from it, hopefully. It is for me. And when I study, I try to formulate my own ideas, my opinions, see what I see. And I will be sharing these with you spontaneously. But no engines, because the idea is for us to develop our own thoughts. So let's get to it. Okay, so the first game that we're gonna be looking at in Ludwig Bachmann's Complete Chess Strategy is between Grunfeld and Steiner. It's a game that was played in 1933. Um, Bachmann actually doesn't put any comments before move 19, except for a couple of variants on the opening, probably not really important. So I'm going to just skip ahead to the 19th move where we'll see the first relevant comment on our lesson on blockading pawns. So d4, d5, c4, d6, c3. This is standard opening theory, so. Huh. Okay. Grunfeld is out for blood. <laughs> F5, exclamation point, and here is where Pachmann begins his lesson. So by removing Black's E pawn, White strengthens his D pawn and forces through E5. However, he has to foresee the following sacrifice in the game, uh, as otherwise Black can set up an effective blockade of the center pawns. Rook takes f5. Now he points out that this is actually stronger than e takes f5, whereupon black would reply f6, rook de1, rook d7, with the idea of knight d6. And obviously, A beautiful blockading square for the knight. I mean, as far as blockading pieces are concerned, it doesn't get any better than the knight. Okay. So rook takes f5. And bishop c8. Okay, attacking the, the rook. And here, Grunfeld played the sacrifice. I'll let you try to guess it. Um, e5, giving up the exchange and advancing a massive pawn center in the, uh, with the, yeah, that's just brutal. Okay. So he has this to say. After bishop c8, it now seems that black will be able to blockade the pawns after exchanging white's knight on g4. 
However, the following sacrifice gives White mobile center pawns supported by his pieces, leading to a decisive attack. e5. Bishop takes, whoops. Bishop takes, queen a5, attacking a2. Yeah. There are some basic common sense rules about chasing pawns on a2 when your opponent is gunning for your king on the other side of the board. I don't know the strength of Steiner. Um, Grunfeld, of course, is one of the famous grandmasters and responsible for the Grunfeld defense. But I'm guessing he's not a beginner. And if we go under that assumption, then as far as I'm concerned, this looks like he's giving up. I mean, there's no way he can believe that he's going to be grabbing a2, advancing those pawns, and then somehow snatching victory from the jaws of defeat. So, yeah, that's my opinion. I mean, I don't know. If someone played that to me like that, I mean, that's just how I see it. So, okay, knight d2, queen takes a2. And what does Pachman have to say about this? He says that other moves also give white an irresistible attack. Okay. Knight f3. Now, this is not only threatening to win a piece by d6. After which the bishop will have no squares to go to, frankly. These are all covered, so. Um, but it also sets up a winning attack on Black's queen. Okay, as the as the game continuation shows, Black has no defense, as his minor pieces are completely hemmed in by the white pawns. Yeah, that's pretty obvious. It's really not clear that there is any viable defense here. Um, I mean without a lot of help from white giving back his advantage, but still. So, yeah, there's no comment for the rest of the game. And yeah, there's not a lot to say. F6, a mistake, but honestly, was there anything to save him? Rook A1, Queen B3, yeah. And this obviously wins the queen, if which actually plays it. Queen takes b2, but this is obvious. Bishop takes h7, check, discovered, check on the queen. Knight takes h7, queen takes b2, f takes e5, yeah. And now he's just... Rook f3. Okay. So, as we have already stated, the side, the side, sorry, the side with the passed pawns usually tries to exchange or drive away the blockader. Obviously. We see both ideas in the following game between Nimzovich and Gottschall. Okay. So, this is the game between Aram Ninzovich and Hermann von Gottschall. And this is the first of two games that Ludwig Pachmann chose to illustrate the concept of blockading. Now, it needs to be pointed out that Aram Ninzovich is the author of perhaps the most famous book on strategy ever called My System. It's very famous in many languages, and it's really the godfather of books on strategic play. Now. Steinitz is most famous for having really begun the whole systematic study of strategic play and close positions and pawn structure and whatnot. But Nimzovich laid it out in a really clear book with a sense of humor, games of his own, 
um, using terminology that he really came up with on his own. Some of these ideas are still relevant today. Uh, some are under dispute, but there's no really understating the impact of my system on generations of chess players. And, okay, so this game is from 1925 when Aaron Nozovich was at his peak in terms of skill. He was never really a world championship challenger, just to be clear. He was a great player. He's famous for his contributions in opening theory and strict strategy and other things. But yeah, he had some notable wins, of course, but really he was not a world beater. You know, nobody would compare him to Capablanca, Alekhin, uh, even Yui or uh, Bogolyubov, who were challengers uh, during that epic. In any case, let's get on with the game. So we have knight f3, e6, d4, d5, f6, b3, knight bd7. Now, Bachman puts in a few comments in the openings. Um, here he says this is a mistake. He doesn't actually add any text to it, so it just has a question mark. And it needs to be pointed out that any comments, they might be relevant today or not, are still based on an understanding of theory of when he wrote this book, which wasn't last year. I don't know the actual date of publication, but I believe it was in the late 60s, maybe 70s. I'll have to look it up. But it certainly wasn't later than that. Okay, so bishop d3, c6, six. In any case, it's not important. Um, okay. Huh. So here he says this is actually a mistake. And he doesn't explain why. E takes d5. Okay, that's kind of forced. I don't see why this is a mistake, honestly. I mean... Let's look at it very briefly. Um, maybe there's theory on this, and I'm just, yeah. But really, this is a standard type of position where you have some nasty discovered attacks or pins or tricks like that because of the rook attacking the queen x-ray, of course. There's a bunch of pieces in front. But once you start exchanging those pawns, oops, sorry about that. Once you start exchanging those pawns, you have all of those things available. Now, obviously, he cannot take with the C pawn because he'll just lose material. If you were to take, for example, here, then, yeah. And you just got a free pawn. But even if you take with the E pawn as was played in the game, Now, you can't take with the pawn because you do have the knight protecting it. But you can perfectly well play this. There's no, there's no taking on h2 or anything. This doesn't work. So queen b8 it takes. I mean, it's the good bishop, right? I don't know. I could play 95 here. The bishop's covering it, so it's not a problem. Maybe it's a, an opinion on the theory of the time, but I really don't see anything wrong with this. Okay, well, whatever. It's Like I said, it's, it's not really important because that's not what the game's about. But he does bring it up, so you do have to ask yourself. Okay, so he played e4, 
fine. It takes, it takes, it takes, bishop takes, castle, d5, okay. c5, mistake. And he suggests, what? Okay, this looks wrong okay. game. Okay, so as black's opening errors have not been exploited, he could now equalize by knight c5. When bishop takes h7 is bad, okay, because of king takes, knight g5, king g6. Okay, but are you forced to give up your bishop to prove it's bad? Okay. And if d takes c6, knight takes c4, queen d4, f5. Right. Hmm. I'm not arguing this particular position. I am wondering about that whole line of his, though. I mean, again, let's... Okay, the bishop's attacked. Fine. But I have more options than just taking on c6 or sacrificing my bishop on h7. I mean, let's remove the bishop. I don't know. This should be one. Why not? I mean, let's just keep everything targeting that beautiful wide open king position. There might be more precise moves, but this is just a, a, an idea. Aren't you going to have problems with b4? And then, you know, the famous x-ray attack? Now, you can't take on d5. Sorry. <laughs> it's, it gets fun for giving with these letters. Uh, okay. I will master these arrows one of these days. <laughs> you would think I'd have it down by now. All right. But I mean, okay. If you take on d5, for example, b4 is hanging and, you know, you're going to lose your knight. So, yeah, I mean... What do you do for an encore? I think he's wrong. I mean, I don't think knight c5 is anything to to be all happy about. I'm not saying c5 is a great move, the game the game move, but I don't think knight c5 is solving anything here. I think black's king is just waiting to be pummeled, and that knight c5 is really just inviting more trouble on the c file. But okay, let's get on with it. So c5, mistake. And he does say, God shall now appear to have set up an effective blockade of the queen pawn with a reserve blockader on d7. Okay. And what he means by reserve blockader is that right now the blockader, of course, is bishop d6. But if the bishop moves and the pawn advances, you have another blockader preventing the pawn from becoming more troublesome than it is on d7. Not that the knight is going to come to d6. It's not. Okay. However, we shall see that this blockade cannot be maintained. By threats against the enemy king, white succeeds in enticing away the blockading knight and exchanging the bishop, after which the d-pawn will show its power. 
That's very believable. Rook e1, queen d8, bishop e1, okay. Rook e8, queen d3. Not very subtle, is it? <laughs> A slight inexactitude. That's the translation. Okay. He should first exchange rooks, as black could now improve his defenses by exchanging rooks himself. All right. Well, knight f8. Rook takes c8. Queen takes c8. Ah. So I guess the problem is that the queen on e8 loses the ability to, let's say, control some of these squares, you know, like knight g5 and whatnot. Okay. Question really is to how big of a difference does it make? Knight h4 obviously would have been preventable by if the queen were still on d8. One of the blockaders is tied to the defense of the h7 pawn. Okay. So what he's saying is that, yes, we have to protect h7 from the eminent mate. And as a result, that dual function of trying to prevent the d-pawn from advancing, should it manage to do so, is no longer an option. So if you get rid of the bishop, the knight isn't going to help, and therefore that pawn is free to move forward. So he plays f6. Why? For bishop e5? Okay. So he says that if instead bishop e5, bishop takes, queen takes, knight f5. White would also stand far better, but he now increases his advantage by a simple tactical point after f6. Knight f5. Rook d8, and he points out that after taking on d6, rook takes d6, not a problem. Rook d8, oh, tactics. So there's a tactical shot. If you'd like to take a quick second to pause the video and try to look for it, go for it. I have it right in front of me, so there's not really anything I can do about spoiling it for myself. So bishop takes f6. Damn. And he immediately co-sacrifices, or counter-sacrifices, with bishop takes h2. And the justification is, it, it makes sense, actually, um, is the problem is that, oops, sorry, after g takes f6, taking the bishop, we have knight takes bishop, rook takes knight, queen g3 check, and winning back. Peace and material. With the rook on d6 now hanging. And white would be up to exchange. Nice. Okay. So instead, he decides to give back the bishop first so that, you know, there's no shenanigans on d6 anymore. King takes h2, bishop takes f6, queen g3 check, only move to prevent mate, f4. And he points out that the real point of it is to... actually stop 
white, black from planting the queen on e5, threatening not only to exchange pieces, but win the pawn, the, the pawn as well. All right, no arguments, but there's still a bishop on, there's still a pawn on d that's hanging, right? So he plays king h8. Huh. Rook e1. And there's an explanation for this. Why don't we take on d5? And if you take on d5, with rook takes d5, rook e1 is a nightmare. Oh, right. Because of... After rook e1, you will have knight check, and of course this is pinned, and you have El Piso on d5 hanging, so yeah. Fair enough. So king takes h2, queen g3, knight g6, f4, apologies, king h8, rook e1, still going for the same invasion on the e-file, Queen f8, d6. And now we have that really nasty d pawn starting to shove itself down black's throat. Rook d7. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, he's forced to blockade this way because bishop c8 falls to knight e7, queen h6, h6 check, king g1, knight takes f4, right? Because obviously, if, it's worth pointing out, queen takes f4, knight takes g6, h6, g6, thank you for the queen. So knight takes f4, knight takes c8, rook takes c8, d7. Yeah, that's game over. Rook d8, rook e8, and that's all she wrote. So rook d7, queen c3, rook takes d6, giving up the exchange for the pawn. And Pachman points out that, oh, the threat was rook e8. Rook e8, queen takes e8, this is just a threat, so yes. Black did play too. Uh, there were two moves here. Queen takes f6, king g8, knight h6, mate. And if black were to play rook f7, for example, d7, same problem. You're forced to bring back to d7, same situation. You're threatening rook e8, after all. Rook takes e7, rook e8, and same combination. So, takes, bishop takes g6, h takes g6, and he says the rest is a matter of technique. So he doesn't I don't really comment on the last moves. Rook e8, we'll just finish it off here. Bishop c6, rook e8. E3, bishop d7, f5. Game over. Okay. So yet another fascinating lesson by Ludwig Pachmann with the help of Aaron Nimzovich.
And the next game will be between Nimzovich and Salve, Carlsbad, 1911. But we'll leave this for the next lesson, the next study session, um, and wrap up this particular study session on positional play right now. Thank you for joining me once again. Happy chess and good mates.